Yeah. Wait, wave. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the fifth episode of season 11 of Productize Podcast. In this season, we are talking about the future of our cities, the cities we love, the cities we care. And we also want to see cities as a metaphor for products and services and um, the way cities are managed and treat their citizens like real customers they want to retain. So the question we're making is if the mayor will be the equivalent to the CEO of the startup called City, who would take the role of an eventual chief product officer? More importantly, what transformations and improvements could this bring about for the lives of citizens as a whole? And, you know, this is still the same podcast that we started back in 2007, or where innovators, geeks, creators, entrepreneurs come to discuss impactful ideas. Our mission is to inspire people to impactful action. My name is Andre Marquis. I'm your host today, and I'm here with very special guest, Ksenia Shroflina, which I actually, who I had the pleasure to meet um, some seven years ago at Startup Weekend here in Lisbon. Um, actually, not very far away from where we are now. And Ksenia um, is an activist. She's the founder of Invisible City Not for Profit Organization. Xenia is also helping emerging artists to perform more and get paid fairly. She graduated from Moscow State Institute of International Relations, part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with a major in Spanish and Latin American history and diplomacy. Xenia got her bachelor's degree in Spain and her master's degree in the University College of London. She is the co-founder of the civic movement Lisboa Possível for inclusive mobility in Lisbon. And she calls herself a self-employed diplomat for the virtual embassy of the wonderful Russia that we want to see in the future here in Portugal and elsewhere. Xenia, how is it going? How is this year going? Well, the question I really dislike uh, these days because it's really just about transforming my frustration and anger into some kind of action so that I keep myself away from going completely mad. How are you today? Uh, well, um, I today, again, took some actions, finally managed to transfer 10K to a Ukrainian NGO. Uh, this was the result of a festival that we organized at Invisible City to collect funds. So that felt actually good. I think uh, it actually helped myself to reestablish some sanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's really action that cures us from frustration. So that's what I did this morning. Then I agree to every journalist who wants to interview me about what's happening in Russia, because I think this is the smallest uh, bit that I can contribute to uh, future peace, obviously uh, from the comfort of Portugal. Uh, it almost feels wrong that, uh, you know, all I can do is talk, but well, if at least this can shift some minds, then I'm available. All right. Thanks. And thanks for coming and staying with us as well. So um, you also have a very extensive career. We met some years ago and it, it looks like you seek to help people in some way at each step, both your studies, life and now career. So what does activism really mean for you? Well, you are painting me as some kind of a saint. Uh, definitely, this is uh, not how things happen. Just an activist. Um, it's usually just a way of uh, mitigating your own frustration with injustice. Mm -hmm. And at some point, uh, it boils up within you to a point when you go and take that action and then another action and another action and someone notices and then boom, you're an activist. And when people ask me what an activist is, I think it's a bit of a glorified term, but in reality, it just means doing all kinds of random crap that no one else wants to do. Everyone has an opinion about it, and uh, a lot of people would write to you about how you should be doing things. And uh, what an activist does is actually delegates it back, and this is how I do it. I say, okay, would you like to do some of the points you've just suggested? Um, the absolute majority of people say, oh, no, I actually don't know how to do it. I just thought someone else should do it. And then you are that someone else. And that's the, the, the closest, I think the best definition of an activist that I can come up with. I, I find it very interesting. Has um, outsourcing 
the activism you want to see in the world to someone else and and sometimes you have to take it because you just believe in what you believe but when did you start this this path is this something you started in, back in school in russia or during college or when you moved here to you know western europe when do you feel that this is something that actually started has something you're doing and you, you identify yourself doing Well, actually, it was just this morning when I was going through all the questions that I started to uh, unfold my own story and I tried to pinpoint when uh, that shift happened. I think uh, it happened when I was uh, still at school. I had a family tragedy. Uh, my dad was killed and mm. I felt that this injustice is unbearable and uh, I saw how the Russian justice system would not do anything about it. So uh, I started doing my own research in the history class. I remember writing Uh, this paper on uh, corruption and I remember I was the youngest kid in some local competition and they awarded me the first prize because no one wanted to touch that subject and I spent all my free time trying to figure out what corruption was. So that was still back it. in the 90s? That was, I was 15, uh, that would have been somewhere around 1999. All right. Pre-Putin Russia or still the odds in power, right? Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, so if it's okay to ask, what's the reason um, you decided to move to Europe? Because we already met here in Lisbon, in Portugal, and I guess back in 2016 or so, you were you had been here for maybe a couple of years by then, if I remember correctly. Um, was it to get your education? Was it to uh, to live a professional experience? Um, have you always wanted to move to to Europe? How was you know that path there? Well, you know, I think in uh, the 90s, uh, when the Soviet Union um, fell, uh, a lot of Russians were mm -hmm. in love with the idea of the West. And uh, my father was that person. I remember when uh, in 1993, for the first time, uh, we were quite privileged. I mean, my, my dad was an entrepreneur. We went to London and literally it felt like going to a different planet. It felt like we were catapulted into a completely different world, mm -hmm. which does not belong to, to the same planet Earth. Uh, and uh, I was uh, impressed by what I could see. I was really impressed by what other people can achieve together as a society. And I think that's where I started thinking, okay, it is possible because uh, my world is very different from their world. Uh, and um, I was, it was, uh, my, my, my first uh, experience was the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, then I kept on uh, going there to study English and I have my English family. Uh, they adopted me as their as their you know summer daughter, uh, and uh, when uh, you know the tragedy, my, my my personal tragedy, my family happened. I think that what really galvanized them into taking that approach. And so uh, since 1998, I kept on going to Eastbourne in in the UK uh, to spend my summers. And I think part of my education comes from um, just being around very different people and also being around all of Europe because this was the summer destination for all the Italians in the Spanish the whole world, the whole Europe wanted to, to uh, get the kids to learn English. Um, and I wanted to learn more. I wanted to, uh, when I already, uh, I was about to finish my university in, in Moscow, uh, I wanted to learn how to academically, I can think differently. And that's when I applied for uh, every scholarship there was. And uh, first I went to Madrid, mm -hmm. uh, to Complutense. Uh, because this was my major and then I went to University College London on a, a European Commission uh, scholarship Erasmus Mundus and spent two years uh, first in London and then in Prague Czech Republic mm -hmm. and eventually you found Portugal somehow Well, um, it's been this uh, irrational um, passion for everything that's south. Um, again, if I were to do some uh, auto uh, psychoanalysis, it must have been, uh, you will laugh, uh, Andre, uh, it, it, these were these um, soap operas from Latin America. Okay. And I really thought they were cool. I'm loving it already. <laughs> and uh, there's, there was this song by this, you know, pop uh, artist, and it was in Spanish. And I thought it was brilliant. I mean, uh, I'm embarrassed to say this. I thought uh, that music was music. Uh, but anyhow, it worked. <laughs> you still uh, remember the, the music? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> 
uh, the Spanish ref refrain? Ar Argentinian. It was Ar right. an Argentinian song. Uh, I watched that soap opera twice. And I think that's when I stopped watching uh, anything that uh, lasts for over you know, one hour and a half. Um, and uh, that's how I started learning Spanish myself. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in my city, there was not a single person who could speak Spanish. And I found some mad lady in a newspaper who claimed she spoke Spanish. I actually went to her house with my mother. You know, my mother would agree to all kinds of random things that I would invent. Uh, we knocked at her door and, uh, well, I realized she was just mad and she didn't speak any Spanish. Uh, then I just bought a book. Uh, no, I didn't buy it. Uh, it was a 1962 book for uh, the Soviet spies who uh, went to Cuba and the whole book was about convincing Cubans to do a revolution uh, and that's how I learned my Spanish and then I in the university uh, I continued um, and um, it's just um, my love for the sound of the languages and then it was Spanish and wow Italian Italian sounds fantastic I should learn Italian oh, wait, 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 Portuguese of course I have to speak Portuguese and that's how it happened all right um, so looking back um, this was what, 2000 and... Early 2000s. Early 2000s. And, and you came to Portugal in 2012 when everyone was 12. leaving. Yeah, during the, the midst of the financial crisis, right? Mm -hmm. um, everyone was taking the plane out of the country. You're taking the plane to what at the time had been a build-out country. The financial situation was very dire. People must have told you, you're crazy. What are you going to do there? Or... Well, um, you know, when you are from a country that provides you with one of the worst passports to have, and I mean, Russian passport doesn't get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. Even if you uh, if you want to go for a day to the European Union, you have to stand in lines and convince every bureaucrat along the line that you're not going to do something horrible in the EU. You're just maybe a student or you have a work contract. So I had a work contract actually for Italy. Mm. Uh, it was a, the startup that wanted to hire me because they wanted someone who spoke good English. Check, I cope. And then um, Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese. And, and I was like, that's me. And I said, yeah, that's you. And like, oh, bureaucracy. Uh, and then Italy pretty much said, well, you know, we only give uh, this kind of visas in March. And um, it's kafka but it's a reality in March specifically. And that was May. So, okay. <laughs> so, not much. Wait for a can't, do, can't, can't go to. I, I remember I went to an interview in uh, Milan and I uh, was on the plane just crying because of those, who came, who could have come up with such uh, Kafka scrolls. Um, then uh, in Spain, they told me, why don't you get married? I was like, well, anyone interested? Um, <laughs> And then Portugal, the embassy said, what? You want to come to Portugal? No one has come to us asking for visa. Let's help you. And <laughs> okay. I think the whole Institut Camões and the whole embassy, you know, they, they didn't have much to do. And uh, they even didn't have a printer to print visas. They wrote my visa by hand. Okay. And uh, they were amazing. And they said, well, you want to work uh, in Portugal? You want to pay taxes there? Welcome. All right. And there you got your, your visa. Um, and you've been living here for pretty much 10 years now. Yes. Yeah. All right. So you call yourself a self-employed diplomat. Um, can you elaborate on this on this title? Uh, what do you do with this within this role? Well, I studied diplomacy and I went yes. uh, to uh, the, uh, the poshest place in Russia, which is in Gimo, the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. It might sound weird for the Portuguese audience. Why would it be posh? I mean, international relations, no one wants it. It's like if you don't have oh, a good grade. Oh, here they do. They definitely do. It's very posh to go into the diplomatic career as well. Well, the Portuguese it, one. Yeah, well, in, in the Soviet Union, it was different because it was the only way to actually see the world. So anyone who is minimally curious and really wanted to see uh, uh, the world outside of the frontiers of the Soviet Union would try to be a diplomat. Right. And that's how they created that myth of being a really cool school. And I mean, it was a, a, you know, a, an okay school. I, I can't complain. I think they, they, they do teach you languages very well. Mm -hmm. uh, they have 53 languages. Uh, and and it's, a very, uh, it's a good representation of Russia because they have uh, dedicated, uh, value-driven people as well as some corrupt uh, crooks. 
Um, so I went in there and I had this dream. I wanted to be an ambassador to Spain. Don't ask me why. This was absolutely irrational. I just thought, why not? And yeah. I wanted Ar to be... Argentinian soap operas. Argentinian soap operas, they're all there. That, that, that music was still in the back of my mind, you know, Xenia going to, to be the next ambassador. Um, and uh, I was silly enough not during five years of my career in uh, that uh, diplomatic school to actually check how many women uh, ha held the position of, uh, uh, of, of an ambassador. And then I was I remember I was doing my obligatory practice in the ministry, which really just uh, I, I didn't have any illusions. I was not going into the diplomatic service, uh, I think, uh, about um, around the time I was in the, on the second or third year, uh, because uh, I realized it was a machist organization. They need to you needed to not have ovaries because uh, inside of that organization, a woman is a secretary and there is a very clear a ceiling uh, and you have to probably marry somebody inside and that's how you progress in your career or you have to be someone's daughter and maybe your daddy will help you i didn't have uh, any intention of becoming someone's daughter or someone's uh, wife uh, so uh, and 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 uh, as uh, you know life would want it i my first uh, obligatory uh, practice in the ministry was on the 8th of march which is the international women's day mm -hmm. and i remember uh, they are standing there and listening to the head of the uh, european department which is the Porsche's department because in the richest countries, right? Uh, everyone wants to work in the European department. This is just reality, huh? And um, he said, well, I would like to cheer to uh, the women who uh, help us in our work. It's like, wait a second, am I the only one here who thinks that this is completely wrong? And all other ladies were just standing there and applauding. I was like, whoa, 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 no, I'm not staying here. I think and we've so seen similar, uh, <laughs> similar, <laughs> similar pictures uh, like that very recently. Um, or at least it comes comes to my mind has quite the same show, and but 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 look, you were telling me they teach you languages. Um, you 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 say to speak nine languages, and I I, I think that's very impressive. So were were you learning those languages in the school? Was that part of the requirements of going to diplomatic career that you have this wide wide, wide knowledge of different languages, or you just willing to learn and, and really wanted to know more. No, you just need to speak two languages uh, in uh, for, for to be a diplomat. You need to speak English and you need to speak some other language. Mm -hmm. And um, other I, than than Russian. Other, well, obviously, yeah, obviously. Russian is, is 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 not even included in the mm -hmm. list. So um, I just love languages. That's why I went to the school because I thought, well, um, I could be so useful. I could go to so many countries and maybe uh, you know change visa regimes and um, convince the foreigners that you know Russians uh, should be included uh, uh, in more projects and uh, be the face of the Russian diplomacy. And I remember I, I wrote the paper saying, I'm not going to this school because this is, you know, it, everything is, is the reverse. In, in that system, you have to come and say, I'm not going to the diplomatic school uh, because I just didn't see their values matching with mine. And uh, with time, I realized that uh, as a representative of the civil society, I kind of work as a diplomat. So jokingly, I say I'm a self-employed diplomat and I know um, I do it in my free time. All right. And now you're going to all this... TV uh, opportunities here in Portugal, speaking to journalists. And um, when they invite you, and I, I've seen you on TV more than a couple of times here in national TV and so on, usually what's their uh, angle? What what kind of angle do, do they want to see? Uh, are you speaking about has, you know, um, a Russian living in Portugal or, um, you know, what, 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 what kind of uh, things that they expect you to say? Um, what is the angle that they are expecting as journalists from you? Um, to their credit, I think uh, most of the question, I mean, the absolute, no, actually all of the questions I receive is all about, you know, tell us, give us hope that Russia is uh, not as horrible as we know it is and mm. that uh, someday it will change. I think that's, that's what, right. what everyone wants to hear. I mean, that's what uh, we want for Russia. And um, of course, all of these interviews come in the context of uh, Russiagate when you know, Medina shared my data mm -hmm. uh, and uh, whenever there is something happening in Russia, they call me i mean now it's every day because russia is just committing a genocide um and they just want to understand if there are russians different from the psychopaths in power right so i you know let me ask you this rather maybe strange question but you've been living here for 10 years it just said medina you know russian gate medina um situation when he was a um, 
the mayor of the city of Lisbon. Now he's the minister for uh, finance, right, from the current government. Do you think there is some kind of democratic deficit in Portuguese society? Because, you know, it doesn't, you know, on paper it doesn't make lots of sense what just happened, right? You know, he, he lost his elections and got kind of promoted like to this golden um, place of being the minister of, of finance, which happens to be the, one of the most important, if not the most important ministry in Portugal after being prime minister. So let me tell you what you think about this, because in my perspective, and I'm not even talking about government and so on, you know, from the ground base people. Um, uh, you know, the, the Portuguese people tend to accommodate themselves very easily to whatever, right? They're not very vocal about their own rights or about their own um, powers, constitutional powers to claim for their rights. Um, do you see that on a daily basis? Um, um, do you feel... Do you feel that because you've been living in the UK, you've been living in you know Spain and Czech Republic and so on? So, vis-à-vis -vis other European countries, how how do you see the the democratic culture here? I think there's definitely uh, well, Portugal is a democracy, and democracy is not some kind of a given state. It's a bit like happiness, you know. Happiness is not something you have. Happiness is something you need to work on. And, and democracy is happiness because it's 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 the, the uh, base condition for for human happiness. Because democracy means that justice has a chance to win, uh, and uh, it's a process, and it's a process that you have to defend every day. You don't have some kind of a democratic nirvana and then everything is democratic uh, uh, after that point. Right. Every day you need to take some actions to uh, put the world to rights. And and uh, in Portugal, um, it's uh, still uh, it, it's a process as in many other countries. Uh, what I see, uh, how I see my position here is that I love to test systems and uh, I've I've had this privilege of becoming a Portuguese citizen and I can actually demand democracy and everything I've done uh, so far was actually thinking, okay, how can I poke democracy? What will happen? Uh, does it work? And you know, a lot of people, a lot of uh, lawyers with whom I met, uh, uh, or with whom I had met before, you know, uh, everything uh, came to light. Said, "Oh, don't even try. Uh, you will, you will. Uh, it will be bogged down in years of uh, frustrating uh, court cases. Nothing will come out of it. Uh, you, you lose lots of money." I was like, "Well, wait, heck it. I'll try. I'll uh, write uh, the case, the, the complaint, and see what happens." And so I tried in every way to uh, provoke the system and say, okay, this was not right. You know, the Dona the, Lourdes, the, the, uh, in, in that case, it was actually a man who sits uh, on a forever salary in uh, the mayor's uh, administration. You know, that's not right. Uh, I, I need to see if I can do something about it. And what I discovered is, okay, there is democracy, but uh, it only works if there are interests. You know, there are values and their interests. Uh, of course, the values are there, but the interest is that you need to have a context um, uh, you need to have a, a historical context. And in this case, it was elections. And uh, BSD clearly wanted to win the elections in any way possible. Mm -hmm. And so they found my case and just uh, put the clutch yeah, around it agenda. and put it into the political agenda. And in a way, we were lucky because had there not been the election campaign, no one would have cared about our case. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's some Russians, who cares? Okay, she came out with some poster, who cares? Free Navalny, uh, far away, whatever. Uh, but because of this uh, competition, uh, it worked. The but democratic again, competition. But it is a democratic competition. So in this way, I think democracy did have its play because there is a democratic competition between two major parties. Right. All right. So. Um, tell us a little bit about your project, Invisible City. Uh, what is it about nowadays? Uh, how did you come up with this idea? Which, you know, I happen to know you from those early days and it has been a, an ongoing project, but um, is it closely related to your own needs, which were not fully fulfilled? So you decided to entrepreneur on this specific topic. Well, I would probably quote uh, Fernando Pessoa. 
uh, the greatest poet of one of the greatest poets of Portugal who said that um, uh, art is but a symptom that life is not enough. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought that, okay, I, I sleep, I eat, but what's next? How am I different from a rat? Right. And art, art is a symptom that life is not enough. Yes. Okay, that's a beautiful thing. Never heard of it myself. Uh, so this is why I've, uh, you know, it, it, all the languages I learn, I don't care about, you know, telling people uh, you know, boring things in a day-to-day -day life. I, it's really about having access to poetry and to literature. And this is why I learn languages and music and, and a theater is one way of uh, experiencing uh, life, experiencing uh, what, who we are as humans. And it's a beautiful way. It's a pleasant way of doing this. It, it's, it's, it's just pleasure, really. So this is why I always wanted to know where true art happens in, in, in different cities that I've lived. And it was very difficult to find it. And that's how Invisible City was born. I mean, it had lots of retirations and uh, uh, reincarnations. Uh, right now, uh, first, I thought it was my problem, I couldn't find it. And then uh, I, I knew how to find it. And I realized, well, people, maybe not everyone cares. And, and then I realized that a big problem that I was facing was actually artists that they are not paid well, uh, whenever there is something that, uh, you know, a tragedy or happiness, they ask to play for free. <laughs> so I thought, well, uh, uh, probably it's not just my myself while I'm helping him. I want to help artists and I want to make sure that uh, talented people don't uh, waste their talent uh, and actually uh, give what's best of them to all of us. And you have been organizing events specifically now to, you know, to essentially events of solidarity towards the Ukrainian people. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the this last one that you have organized and how did that came out? Um, you know, how much time did you actually take from idea conception towards uh, implementation? Sure. So the latest reincarnation of Invisible City uh, was uh, during COVID. Uh, okay, everything is closed. What are we doing? Okay, let's go uh, online. And of course, we had lots of critics now who wants to listen to music online. And we realized lots of people want to do it because they never had or they never had had access to this because it's expensive and i realize that a lot of our users you know they're global uh they come from all kinds of uh geographies especially you know people who for instance doctors they can't uh just on any single or on any given day go to casa music in porto or uh, to sister bay in lisbon because they have to be serving people but if they have that hour they can connect online uh and if they have good uh equipment they can enjoy music from uh Tunis, Egypt, New York, whatever. Mm -hmm. So this was our product market fit. We realized that we have a way to help artists from anywhere and uh, help people from anywhere and connect them through uh, through art. And we have done this for two years. Uh, and when uh, this happened in Ukraine, when the war started, one of our users actually uh, wrote to me saying, hey, let's organize a festival. Uh, we will sponsor the artists. Uh, we will uh, bring all of our community. Uh, uh, we'll help you with communication. And let's just get uh let's collect money I was like, yeah let's do that because we already we are sitting on uh, heaps of experience and so uh it took us exactly a week exactly a week, a week. one week but why a week because i had already established uh after hours and hours of sound checks and interviews a good relationship with the artists and i just had to write to them saying guys two songs this hour be there in time for sound check let's do it and uh we did almost three hour and a half of a festival from um the, we had 22 artists uh from georgia to colombia and we collected uh 14,650 euros which you gave to a charity or we gave to two charities uh one is uh children of uh voices of children it's a children of war so this is a project in ukraine that helps uh kids with trauma and i particularly like this because it's not only immediate help but it's also dealing with the consequences uh psychological consequences mm -hmm. consequences of war uh i found them through my ukrainian friends uh, just had to do all the checks of course because we had a, a long list of organizations and we said okay like, this is something that can have the biggest impact long term mm -hmm. and there's another one which is uh translators without borders they're lesser known and they also come from our partner from the linguistic industry because a lot of people just don't speak languages and uh they need linguistic help and uh, they absolutely. provide uh, this help absolutely so much you need right now and what's the relation between Lisboa possible which is the project that we just um that we are also representing here today and invisible city what's what's the connection how one 
became well they didn't become the other and they, they're not the different projects but when did Lisboa Possible started to get in shape well, they are different projects and they come from different needs. You know, the job to be done there is different, Absolutely. but uh, they are connected in a way that was actually uh, one of, uh, I was doing an interview with uh, an exit interview with one of our users from in, in Invisible City mm -hmm. from Barcelona. And uh, he said, I want you to organize a festival. It's like, wow, well, what do you mean a festival? You know, everyone has a festival. And then we started uh, discussing this idea and we came this came up with this uh, idea for a festival, which is a uh, possible city where, you know, we have art and philosophy and, uh, and good uh, urban decisions, maybe in a specific village where you know we can show that things can work. And then I had this idea, and it was just uh, you know I, I was uh, brewing it in my mind. And then uh, when the elections happened uh, and uh, Moedas won, I felt personally responsible for this. I really felt that okay, Xenia, you uh, screwed up the plan for uh, bike lanes, and um, you know it's one of those situations when there are two unrelated issues, uh, Russia Gate and bikes yeah it's uh, one of those they call it the butterfly effects right <laughs> one a good description yeah it's chaos um unintended consequences so Lisboa Possible is we were talking about it the other day it's almost like a an activism accelerator so I come from the startup <laughs> accelerator world so I really like the accelerator uh, metaphor here um, so mostly you are working towards mobility improvement in Lisbon, right? And how and 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 when um, did you kickstart this project? Was it the the Almirante Reis uh, initiative? Was it something more broad? And what have you achieved so far? It was quite organic, yeah. So I, I had this name, Possible City. Then uh, when uh, everything happened, and someone you know called me, say, "Hey, you do want to be you know help us with this?" And it's like, "Sure." Uh, and this, um, and then I uh, was I started organizing meetings because I like to put people to talk to each other. It doesn't always work, but uh, and then I could launch this idea. Say, "Hey guys, what do you think about Possible Lisbon, Lisboa Possible?" And then everyone immediately felt like it was their project. It's it's also it's almost dangerous because you know this happened. This name happened with you know, somebody from Barcelona. Um, um, uh, who has nothing to do with it, this. It's a great city. We, we, I mean, it's it's a very inspiring speed city as well in terms of urbanism and, and so on. So it's a definitely a, a great place to, to start. And the name is such a powerful name because it's not impossible city. It's possible city. So it gives lots of hope that things might actually change for, for the better. So what have you achieved so far? I know we have some breakthroughs already. Yeah. So uh, what we achieved... Uh... And this is... The last six months is one year. It ex it has existed for right. six months, not right. even a year. It not started in in October, um, right. right after the elections. Uh, so uh, we managed. So uh, Carlos Moedo said that the bike lane was uh, to be destroyed, and uh, now since last week we know that he has taken that back. I think this is the biggest uh, achievement, uh, making a politician take his words back. Uh, Especially because it was. An electrical uh, an electoral uh, promise right yeah. that was yeah. written on paper and is taking it back um so tell us a little bit more about this bike lane of all people then maybe don't know it so well or not biking on such a regular basis or not from lisbon what steps did you take to develop this initiatives um or this initiative in, in, in specific but first let's go to to the to the bike lane so the bike lane that we have today it's a double bike lane, right? I don't know the technicalities, but I, you know, there's like two bike lanes parallel to each other. One goes one 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 direction, the other goes in the other direction. The decision that the city council, or correct me, maybe it's not a city council, maybe it's I don't know this committee that they have set up to take care of this, is to revert it back to this double bike lane with two directions but on one side of the the road essentially on one side of the on i guess the right side of the road towards the, the south of the the city um is this the best solution you were hoping for or is this the possible solution it is a possible solution so this was the original plan by medina 
actually yeah. let's go back in history yeah. and this was the original plan a lot of people forget about this and then it's like oh uh this is all wrong it's like well wait a second this was the original plan and um i think we really need to test it um uh, we wanted the bike lane to stay whatever on the right on the left uh, we wanted the bike lane to be there and we also wanted uh to avoid the noodle soup because one of the options was to uh take that bike lane around right. the neighborhoods and this is not a good solution because for people who don't have strong legs or don't have uh, an electric bike it's ups and downs and it's uh, uh not something encouraging for uh um, cyclists that uh, are not yet very confident with with, with their own bodies <laughs> i found i found it uh, very curious then when carlos Weathers was uh, kind of apologetically speaking on his own uh, video saying, oh, you know, the bike lane is staying. And the reason it's staying is because the alternative solution would take lots of uh, bike, parking, parking spaces, parking spots from uh, cars. Like, man, why? So there's so, so, so many things that are wrong with what Carlos Mendes is, is saying. But uh, one thing we know is that he says one thing and then he takes it back. So uh, my only hope is that he, he said lots of objectively silly things there uh, that don't make sense for uh, an, uh, a, a good city. Um, and my personal objective is, okay, keep on talking to Carlos Muedes, uh, whatever it takes, and convince him uh, to take his words back and do the right thing. You know, my take, my personal take, you know, I, I, I was a supporter of Carlos Muedes uh, um, from day one, when the day that he uh, announced his campaign, maybe day zero. And I, I always try to explain Carlos Moeda when I had the chance, like, look, man, I'm a biker. <laughs> why, why this uh, anti-biker thing? But I understand that the constituency of lots of his voters are, are car lovers or car dependent or people that don't get bikes, right? And yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't like to be in his shoes. Being a politician is hard. But I, I think he gets it wrong when he sees himself, you know. He's car, pleasing the wrong crowd. He's pleasing the wrong crowd. And lots of people voting for him, definitely lots of people that voted for him in the last elections, are definitely not the, the people that he, ha that he thinks that he uh, has, has to please to. But anyways, um, you have this first um, breakthrough. And I think, you know, congratulations to you, to the group that is behind it, because you have been organizing um manifestations petitions you did lots of other actions you've also mentioned that you had to learn it the hard way that you, you were learning on on the job so to speak so tell me about this uh, journey uh, the actual organization the petitions any specific tips that you have for activists want to be for people that that want to engage themselves in uh, some kind of political activism because you now see yourselves almost like an accelerator for civic action initiatives, right? Well, for, for other other mm -hmm. ones than this. Well, we were not the only ones organizing this. We were born mm -hmm. uh, by actually filtering through people who uh, wanted to do something, and there are other organizations. And I think the difficulty is in uh, other organizations that are um, not particularly uh, well. Uh, organized for achieving such goals. I'll explain what I mean. Uh, the question that I get asked most of the time from everyone, especially other organizations or, you know, Angel Pereira, when we had a meeting with him, the first question was, what is your legal status? I think, you know, why are you asking me to marry you without, you know, even knowing who I am? First, look at my actions. So a legal status is nothing compared to what you can achieve. And this is what we do at startups, right? You don't constitute a legal entity unless you know who the founders are, you know, unless you know if you can work with them. Work with them for three months. See if you don't kill each other. It's the same with relationships. You know, you don't marry someone and start sharing a house without actually testing it. Test and learn. Try to live with this person. Mm. Try to understand their political ideas. Try, try to understand who they are. And this is what is uh, not working in the activist world because everyone thinks that first you need to have a legal entity. And in Portugal, that means nine people going to one place <laughs> many times trying to sign something. And this, yeah. it, it's busy work instead of actually working on real objectives and figuring out who are the people who can work on those objectives. Because a lot of people say they want to do it, but very few people, when you say, okay, is it done? It's actually done. Right, Sani. So what's your legal status? None. 
we we don't have a legal status because we don't want it yet mm -hmm. because we need to we are what we started working in, and actually filtering people through and f figuring out who are the co-founders who are the people who actually put real work real output and this means you know making videos um yeah. contributing with the real ideas i also have a podcast yourselves right? having a podcast uh finding time to meet with officials organizing parties we have one on uh, thursday on thursday yes we'll talk about it um all right so but the, the other day you were also telling me right now we have people coming to us and say hey xenia and lisboa possible the group uh we have this idea do you help us or can you help us promote this agenda are you also outsourcing or better way are you training people or are you uh, educating others towards this action somehow or giving them uh, some playbook to guide them on and navigate these waters we have to we are there aren't that many people who actually get things done mm -hmm. uh, and this is why i believe that it has everything has to be transparent and i need to share everything i know so others can do it better and uh, we started this uh, academy which just you know how to organize a manifestation i didn't know how to do it i had to ask people so, so okay why would i keep is, it to is myself? that is that online is that it's something? online it's on our website is it uh, go it's to SM. lisboa possible and then one of the first things is called the Sound, actually School of Action. Sound. All right. So is that like an open source um, template? Is that like an open source booklet that people can go to? And they have templates, documents to kickstart their own initiatives? Even emails uh, in the Camera Municipal so they can write emails oh, to wow. the right people. So it's very Lisbon centric right now. It's very Lisbon centric and it's very of specific. Of course, if you are in Porto or you are in wherever you are, you want to create your own, <laughs> I would say, chapter. <laughs> Just maybe you can create it there, right? And just you can create for your own specific purpose, your city. All right, that's great. Uh, I didn't know that, that it was such a, you know, such a resource uh, oriented uh, uh, project. Okay, so this Thursday, you were you were saying that uh, you're going to have this event dedicated to uh, petition writing, like a workshop. So feel free to pitch your event here and invite people to join if they want. Sure. Well, actually, I'll go back to the previous right. question. Uh, so uh, this very uh, petition, the last one uh, okay. to have uh, bike lanes, which is already here, okay. um, uh, was uh, an initiative by a citizen of uh, a, a Lisboner who wrote to us after then we discovered after having written to many other organizations who just mm -hmm. kicked him back, ignored him, ignored him and said, well, nah, nah, what do we do? I was like, OK, he wrote to us, like, let's do it. Do you know how to write petitions? I was like, no, I was like, OK, here's why you do. here's the link. Uh, here's how you write a text. You write a text. We all corrected it five times. Then we agreed on one text. Okay, let's print it. And the guy said, well, Pedro, uh, he's like, okay, I'm printing the stickers. Put his own money into this. Mm -hmm. And then what we did, we I know, tweeted about it. We said, hey, who wants to come and take the sticker, put it somewhere. And we have some like 20 people putting stickers around. Um, and this is activism. We want to support him. So what are you acting on? Uh what, what is there? A Puyem Zavaisha Ciclavel. What is that project about? So we want to have uh, bike lanes uh, in um, Baisha. There is none, mm -hmm. uh, not a single bike lane. Uh, a lot of people came to us, not a lot of people, but some of the people, you know, the one who like to complain and never do anything. It's like, oh, yeah, but we want uh, zona there, so we want uh, no cars. And I have to think very pra pra pragmatically. Uh, I've met uh, Angel Pereira, I've met Jean Castro, I've met a lot of people from the camera, you know, the hard way, like really just knocking the doors and mm -hmm. complaining a lot because it's not like, they, they open the door to you immediately. No, 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 no. no, no, no. no. And uh, I realized that if we want to achieve something in these four years, we want to uh, find something that works for them and works for us. For us, we want uh, uh, bike lanes because this is what and makes us safe. Let us just explain here the concept. So uh, personally, I find it pretty ridiculous that it is up to a citizen movement to have to promote bike lanes in such part of town that is still disconnected from the rest of the bike network and it's still you know it's essentially it's like that the, it's like a war zone yeah it's it's the downtown uh it's Pasha literally means downtown of lisbon and it's so strange because there's radials of bike lanes towards west towards north towards east but then in Baisha itself, there is no bike lane. So I, I did it. My, I'm doing it almost on, on a daily basis now when I when I go to work. And once you get to Baisha, coming from Almirante Reis, then you have to navigate through that maze of cars and 
streets, you know, hopping one, one way to the other. And it's up to you guys to have to promote this. Um, and I guess one of the reasons is because there was this vision from the ex-mayor that they would make this a zone as zero or zero or zero. And now there is this limbo because this current mayor doesn't really want to go into zero. So what you guys are trying to do with um, this bike lane initiative is that, all right, at least connect the bike lanes of Baisha, right? So people can actually go through Baisha in a safe in a safe way. Yeah, we're trying to do what is possible. I mean, we I'm I'm I'm, I'm kind of a person. I'm, I'm I like to look at facts, and I want to understand where you know the money comes from. And I understand that PSD and Carlos Muedes, you know, they have connections with ASAP, which is you know they, they they get money for the campaign from somebody who you know sells cars and car insurances. So it's very difficult politically for them to go and say we're well, we're going to have lots of bike lanes now. But I understand that they also uh, they will evolve. I I, I think and I think Carlos Muedes is evolving and understanding that maybe what he thinks is his electorate. Is not his electorate, and he can win a lot of votes if he actually ACP understands. the same. ACP the same. I'm, you know, I'm a very happy SCP member. I'm also. People tend to forget that bikers are also car owners. You know, ninety nine. Some of them. Some you know, ninety percent of them, right? So you know, you're not biking one hundred percent of the time. You're not driving one hundred percent of the time. Sometimes you have to do one or the other. Um, and they don't get it that this new generation, millennials towards uh, Gen Zs, even older people. Think differently. All, think differently. Exactly. They they want mobility at the at first and foremost, right? It's that they should evolve into a mobility club membership or something like that. Just not just be sent a car centric. It's uh, in my opinion very uh, reductive of and, what they could do. And you know what what we're doing is we're actually doing the you know custom interviews mm -hmm. and uh, trying to uh, tell the product managers who are you know the, the the city managers that this is the reality and you need to adapt yourself to the product that you should be building. You, they're still stuck in somewhere in the, in, in the 80s and the 90s and mm -hmm. they're thinking they haven't realized that they can win the elections and people's hearts if they actually sure. listen to the people. And, and uh, what we're doing as activists for free uh, is, I mean, we, we do have a you know, GoFundMe campaign, uh, but we're doing their work. And they should be doing this. The politicians, the juntas de Fiquisi, yeah, they should be going after. You're asking. doing a field research for free and providing them but, you know, I guess that's also part of the activism uh, work. Eventually, things go right that might change. And that's why we're also trying to promote this agenda, right? Making cities behave a little bit more, has proper product managers and doing uh, user interviews, going to the field, doing research and understanding what what this current demographic that is in the city really wants. All right. So um, I think I've interrupted your uh, train of thought. So feel free to pitch your upcoming event and, and invite people to join if, if you want to. Sure. So this Thursday at uh, 1945, and this is a serious uh, claim here, 1945, not one hour later, we want people to come uh, if they want, of course, because it's going to be a party, uh, to a really hip and uh, echo-minded place in Anjush, which is called Amata. Amata. Um, um, Amata, yeah. Which means the the forest the forest the woods the, the woods. woods come to the woods come to the woods and the mata is is what is like um artist residence is, is... it's a space it's a space uh, they sell plants uh and uh they will have beers uh, at one euro for specifically for lisbon uh the possible lisbon but also other uh other drinks uh and what we want to do uh, and, and uh, my uh, co-founder rita uh is already preparing the menu uh vegetarian venue she'll cook because oh. uh you know as a, a, a movement as a startup and you do with your garage what you can yeah. so our garage is her kitchen so she can cook this is how we cut costs right we we do what, what we can with our own means Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we, it's, we, we call it a party, but it's, it's a practical party. So we want uh, to get people together to actually work on something very specific. Uh, we have a question, uh, which is, what is your heretic dream? It sounds better in Portuguese, qual é o teu sonho heretico? And not to confuse with other words. Um, and so when they respond, when they resp uh, you know, on, on Meetup, what the heretic, heretic dream is, we will uh, make it an, into an assignment. And we already have quite a few, and we will uh, randomly uh, group people uh, so that they can work together. And I think it's through working together in something specific that they can, you know, 
get to know each other yeah. and maybe make new friends because we want activists to meet other activists, especially people who really want to get things done and not just mandar bitaitas, you know, just say things for the sake of saying. And then once this That's is done... That's a national sport in Portugal. Has oh, it's know. a human sport. It's not just Portuguese. It's, it's, it's everywhere. It's the same. And then we actually have a concert because we want to have a certification after some work. Uh, we have uh, Luis Gabriel Lopes, or Luis Gabriel Lopes, because he's from Minas Gerais, uh, one of uh, the artists we absolutely love. And he happens to be in, in Lisbon. He's like, yeah, I want to support your movement. Right. So he'll be playing for us. And we pay him because this is, you know, invisible city uh, mentality here. We'll pay from the donations we've received. We still have some left. Uh, so we'll have a concert with very good music. Um, and then everyone is free to do whatever they want, uh, make new connections, ask for LinkedIn uh, numbers, uh, have more beers or have more uh, uh, water with gas, whatever they want, uh, because we want uh, as the output of this is that people actually learn how to write a petition or create a guerrilla campaign so that then we can work on that and keep on uh, provoking the power to be and uh, uh, run more campaigns so that we claim more of the city for, for, for mobility. Very well. Um, fermented wheat soup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, do you have any ideas or plans to, to engage youth uh, in activism within Lisbon, like going to schools or upper secondary uh, students, anything like that? What I like about you, Andrea, is that you always give me ideas. Okay, it's a good idea. No, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, you know, some years ago, I went to a local university um, and I asked how many of you guys are actually biking to the university, right? Zero. Um, schools, I guess, still the same. I go to my kid's school. No one is actually biking to school. I don't really get it. Why not? Because I am. <laughs> uh, they have good legs. They are perfectly good shaped. So, I mean, it's, I know it's not just about biking. Right? It's, it's much more than that. But there's definitely space there for uh, youth activism as well towards uh, this, this space as well. So what do you enjoy the most about uh, what you're currently doing right now? What are you most passionate about? I think you know, when, what drives you? Mm -hmm, I think when I see that other people manage to get things done, I, I love it. I like execution. I, I like when uh, good ideas get greatly executed. I mean, our ideas are not particularly inno innovative or in any way you know, fantastic. They are copies of other things that have already happened, but mm -hmm. it's all about execution. And this is what startups are about. You can have it's an idea, but you can execute it better than anyone else. And I think that's what we would like to do. I, I think that we need to change culture. And that's what we're trying to do. We try to involve all kinds of people into the new culture of, okay, uh, going by bike is not does not equal being poor. It, 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 it is equal being you know, a, a, a citizen who cares. And this is the switch we want to achieve. And I think what I love seeing is when people say, hey, uh, how about we do this? And I say, well, would you like to do that? I say, yes. Uh, and they come and do the work and mm -hmm. that's when we work specifically on the project instead of blah 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 that's amazing very well um yeah i remember something i did uh, a few years ago when i w went to a secondary school in in Lourinha, not you know i don't know 70 100 kilometers north of lisbon and uh it was actually my 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 sister's uh, high school so we took this uh students from destin primaire destin school so that's uh uh, one of the the last years at upper, uh, upper secondary and we asked them about their mobility challenge and keep in mind this is not a city um setting so this is mostly a rural or uh almost rural setting and their mobility challenges were really really striking compared to um urban uh setting but they were so engaged in finding their own solutions and developing their own um mobility solutions that that was really eye-opening to me uh, at least so besides work tanya and besides organizing events and um you know organizing charity events and so on do you have any time for hobbies or um stuff that you do on your free time yeah i dance flamenco every day um, you do yeah dance flamenco mm -hmm. okay that's 
on your own? Do you have like a class? Of people? Well, I used to have a class. I used to go to every class there was. Then uh, COVID happened, mm -hmm. and it was uh, an eye-opening experience for me because I, I I started going to the street. I have you know a little board. Uh, people think I'm mad, especially the people who work at Edda Pair because I go in front of Edda Pair and it's like, okay, she, she, why, why is she dancing alone there? And I you know I need to I need to practice you know the speed of my feet and you know to, to do this about the And it's 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 a uh, it's the only way that actually keeps me fit and uh, fit mentally because I can't think of anything else. Uh, it's art. It's, I find it beautiful. It's, I, I, once I fell in love with flamenco, there's no way back. And it's just what I listen, what I, how I dress, what I do, wow. uh, where I spend my holidays. I, I biked three times to, to Spain uh, this week, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, year. I'm, I'm going there soon again. Um, and yeah, that's from Lisbon. You biked from Lisbon to, well, I took, a, I took the train in the middle and then whenever there's no more train, I bike. Yeah, there is no train connection to Spain. No. Oh, <laughs> tell me about that. I'm, I'm the expert of how to get myself to Spain. <laughs> you know, there's other. It's like you have train connections from Ukraine to all those countries. Uh, luckily, and there is between two European Union countries, there's no train connection between Portugal and Spain. Well, but I won't, there is a uh, there is a way to get there, but you know, it's a bit painful. It is. I mean, yeah, I, I, I've heard about it. You have to take out, get out of the train. <laughs> Go by car, take another train in Spain. I, I guess you can do that, or by by bike, um, or just walk. All right. Um, look, if you had three months to learn a relatively new technology, which one would you choose? And let me just tell you, we're, we're also talking about it the other day. But I see some non for profits going into this NFT space to develop uh, so called social impact NFTs, and you know get uh, get some money out of selling those. Um, any any specifics, uh, technology or or stuff that you are interested in right now? Well, unfortunately, I'm not a techie. I wish I were. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I would uh, be a lot richer. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't think I have a good answer to this particular question. I've, I've thought about it for hours and days. Uh, and uh, the technology I've been learning, uh, languages and, and dance. So maybe if language is the ultimate technology, right? So I'm learning Turkish right now. So if I could not do anything, and if if and if they just had all the bike lanes in Lisbon, and uh, I could just focus on my own things, I'd just spend three three months uh, learning, learning Turkish. Turkish. <laughs> How hard is it for someone that speaks nine language to to learn the the tense one in this case Turkish? Because it's a very different Indo-European language, but it's still... not a non-Indo-Euro. It's not an Indo-European language. It's an Alanian language. Uh, right. Well, uh, my father's Tata, so uh, mm. was Tata, so I'm half Tata. I don't speak Tata, but it's a Turkic language, so I I know all the grammar. Just so I I I don't have vocabulary, and I just I find the language so beautiful. I love how it sounds, and it actually sounds differently for 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 girls and for boys. And I really mm. like how girls speak it. So uh, I just it's, it's it's this irrational passion for something you hear. All right. Wow. Um, are, you, are you planning to partner or co-organize any um, hackathon or um, some kind of initiative to revamp uh, innovations for activism? Um, for instance, what kind of innovations would you uh, ask for if you had a chance to ask techies? Um, and I guess some techies might be listening to you for a better uh service that you are using right now and of course you are using sonpublica.com a lot Horrible. which seems to have frozen in 1995 web 1.0 <laughs> it didn't any it didn't cross through web 2 or uh, web 3 alone um so yeah uh, what kind of sp specific requests if you have like a, a hackathon and have all the stackies in, in front of you would you ask them to to do for well Again, you always give me ideas. So if anyone has good NFT ideas, which I don't understand the space, and want to talk to me with real projects that we can work on, please uh, right. come NFTs to me. NFTs for social impact. Yeah. And, and um, how to safely transfer uh, citizen data when there is a petition. I mm. am really uncomfortable with the existing solution because mm. I can anyone who runs a petition can see it. And a petition publica, which is a 
considered uh, one of the ways that, you know, for instance, uh, Assembly of the Republic accepts uh, petitions. petitions from there. Mm. I think they shouldn't because we ch we chose it, but it's it's horrible. It's full of uh, horrible ads that distract people yeah. and uh, uh, yeah. take their data. Absolutely. And then uh, there's no way to collaborate. So, for instance, you can't have we different should, users. We should, that, should we, we should do hackathon. a better, yeah, we should do Let's a hackathon for that. I mean, there were some hackathons in the past, like the, the one from Gulbenkian, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, I don't want to say something wrong from Maze, but it was the, the guy's uh, it was, it was called uh, Hack for Good. That was the name. Um, I'm not super sure if they are still active, but that's definitely something we should try to look into. Finally, what words of advice would you give your younger self, 18-year-old Xenia, just on the brink of going into uh, that posh Moscow State University? Would you tell her do the same go to the same place would would you give her some other kind of recommendation words of advice as in words of wisdom right not necessarily specific future events going to happen because you travel in time but words of wisdom well i always say that whatever path you take is the right path because if you are a traveler through life that's the the only philosophy that uh, helps you mm -hmm. but then uh, i think what you're saying is that we are indeed path dependent uh, because if we learn to be a doctor then others can't compete with us because yeah. we we know the field so uh Today, I might have chosen something like architecture because I love geometry uh, and I've uh, met people who are architects and think they're doing great, great things. Or I would have chosen uh, maybe physics uh, or um, um, a biology. Uh, but because I wanted to do something for the society, I never even considered that. So neither art nor uh, you know sciences, although I, I, I was good at it at school. So I might have uh, become a scientist uh, had I thought uh, uh, had I been surrounded uh, by a different country. <laughs> do, do you have to take uh, maths in upper secondary yeah. in, in Russia all the way to the last year? Yeah. No matter what, what kind of path you, you choose. I did not not the, like in the Portuguese the system where, full you know, it. when you're 15 years old, you don't like maths, you're good to go and you just take Portuguese and that's it. No, that's your final exam. You had, you, I had to be good at maths because this was the most important exam I had to pass. All right. But still, you ended up going to languages and run away from maths once you got to university. Well, because I wanted to uh, be useful in uh, diplomacy. That was a childhood dream. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So what kind of you know, book or media art would you recommend our listeners to read or listen to? I actually have a couple of ideas. Um, uh, the first one would be definitely read Why Nations Fail, mm -hmm. because that really helps to uh, undo this uh, thinking that it's all culture and that uh, because we're Portuguese, we're doomed. No, uh, you know, Portuguese had slavery, Portuguese had dictatorship. They got themselves out of that. It's institutions, not just culture. So do read uh, Why Nations Fail by Ajamogu. I really love that book. Uh, second, um, uh, from um, maybe more artistic side, if you haven't read Saramago's, uh, um, uh, oh, I don't know the, the English translation, Levantado do Chão, uh, Levantado do Chão. Uh, I think it really explains uh, Portugal and uh, how people thought. But you also read it and you understand that the, the world has changed and some of those ideas have already been resolved and we need to move forward. Uh, and I think from the perspective of, of literature and from you know, uh, written word, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's beautiful. It's both informative and uh, artistically pleasing. Um, and uh, for philosophy, I would absolutely uh, recommend uh, my best friend, Seneca. Uh, I've kept that book uh, in all my travels. It's been with me for over 10 years and I keep on reading it. Um, uh, if you haven't read Seneca, uh, he seems like you know the guy from your neighborhood. Uh, you can't feel the 2000 years of distance. And maybe for the final book, also to fight uh, esoteric tendencies that a lot of us have, uh, and kind of uh, not understanding who we are. Is, it's an old book, uh, The Selfish Gene. If you haven't read, mm -hmm. read it, please do. Yeah. It really explains how we humans evolved and, and uh, who we are and how uh, we pass on um, genes and knowledge. It, it's, it's, it's a brilliant book. Yeah, genes and memes. 
Right. Thank you, Xenia. It was great having you with us. Thank you so much. Such an insightful uh, perspective. Also, thanks for joining us uh, at the Productize podcast. If you enjoyed your stay, give us your review on the Spotify podcast and share this episode with friends and colleagues. You also have show notes where all these books are going to, to be there and more episodes at productize.medium.com. Join our community. We will share the links in the chat and on the podcast description. Thank you. By the way, this podcast was also hosted um, by me, Andre Marquis, with research by my colleague, Avalina Bognun uh, from Lithuania, and sound editing by Miguel Souza from Portugal. All right.